Before you can face off against goblins, skeletons, vampires, and dragons, you'll have to conquer the first, and in many ways the most challenging foe in Pathfinder 1E, the character sheet. But never fear, I'll be walking you through the ins and outs of Pathfinder 1E's character sheet, so you can get right into the action. In this guide, you'll learn how to put in your ability scores, attacks, feats, and much, much more. But before we kick things off, if you'd like to take your game further, join the D6 Damage Discord. We have fantastic discussions about all aspects of the game. Dungeon mastering, character builds, and much, much more. Follow the link in the description of this video. We're going to begin on page one of this two-page character sheet at the top. On the right-hand side, you'll find sections for alignment. This is mostly for RP, but it does impact some spells, abilities, and class features. There's also a place to list your race, be it elf, dwarf, human, or one of the other many playable races in Pathfinder. Your choice of race can have a lot of impact on how your character ultimately turns out. You'll also find size. This is almost certainly going to be either small or medium. Any effect that changes your size temporarily is not listed here. The last thing in this section you should be aware of is deity. This might impact class features, especially for divine casters. It can also impact your choice of feat selection. Now, moving on to the left side of page one of the Pathfinder 1e character sheet, there is a section for your ability scores. This is a measure of your character's inherent attributes. Let's start by talking about the physical ability scores. First up, strength. This is a measure of your character's muscular power and physical prowess. Small, weak creatures, like the Quasit Demon, have a strength score of 8, while a big, powerful Minotaur would have a strength score of 18. Strength is a very important ability score for characters like fighters, barbarians, and paladins. Next, we have Dexterity. This is your agility, reflexes, and balance. A barely ambulant zombie would have a Dex score of 8, whereas a graceful Astral Deva would have a Dex score of 18. Dexterity is important for characters that focus on attacking at range. These would be things like sorcerers, gunslingers, and rangers. Rangers specializing in the bow or crossbow, that is. The final physical ability score is constitution. This is a measure of your health and stamina. A churning mass of weak creatures, like a centipede swarm, would have a constitution score of 8. Whereas a monstrosity capable of surviving in nearly any environment, like an Umber Hulk, would have a score of 18. Most classes will benefit from a healthy constitution score. Only the truly brave or skilled should consider actually having a negative modifier to their constitution. Now then, let's look at your mental ability scores. Starting with intelligence, this is a measure of how well your character learns and reasons. A mean and dull-witted knoll would have an intelligence score of 8, whereas a devious nightwing would have an intelligence score of 18. Intelligence is very important for classes with spells influenced by intelligence, like the wizard and alchemist, or skilled classes like the rogue, which have a lot of different class skills that they can take advantage of. Wisdom is the measure of your willpower and common sense. Dimwitted trolls have a wisdom score of 8, whereas sharp and observant emissary devils would have a wisdom score of 18. Wisdom is extremely important for clerics because it runs their spells, and monks also get a lot of benefit from their wisdom. Finally, there's charisma. This is your personality, leadership, magnetism, or appearance. A hideous monster like a manticore would have a charisma score of 8, while as a sprightly resident of the first world like a Nixie would have a charisma score of 18. Charisma is important for sorcerers to empower their spells, 
and party face classes like the Bard, who rely on their silver tongues to resolve all kinds of problems. Methods for determining your ability scores can vary. Some DMs favor the point buy system. This is where you're given a pool of points to spend on your ability scores. Others like the random quality of the dice. You might roll sets of dice to randomly generate the numerical scores that are then plugged into your abilities. However your DM chooses to determine your ability scores, the number that you ultimately end up with will give you what's called a modifier, depending on how high or low it is. The example creatures I gave, unfortunate enough to have an 8 as an ability score, would receive a minus 1 penalty. Anything they choose to do that involves that ability score will be done with this handicap. Whereas those creatures with a clear and obvious strength in the form of an 18 would receive a plus 4 bonus, represented by their plus 4 modifier. Now, a number that's all but guaranteed to go up and down over the course of a game is your hit points. Your HP is determined by your class or classes. Every class has hit dice of a particular size, be it D6, D8, D10, or D12. Every level you get a new hit die, you'll add your constitution modifier to grant you additional hit points. Feats like toughness and favored class bonuses can increase your HP pool even further. Next, speed. Your speed is determined by your size modifier. Medium characters have a speed of 30, whereas small characters have a speed of 20 feet per round. Class features like fast movement can alter this, as well as racial features like the dwarfs slow and steady or the merfolks legless. In addition to your normal walking speed, you may have access to other movement types, such as swimming, climbing, flying, or burrowing. Next, initiative. This is the bonus added to your roll to determine your place in the combat turn order. To determine your initiative, you add your dexterity modifier to your d20 roll. Certain abilities, like the Inquisitor's Cunning Initiative, can give further bonuses to your initiative roll. Next up, AC. Armor class determines how hard you are to hit. To determine your armor class, you have to add certain variables together. Things like your armor bonus, your shield bonus, your dexterity modifier, your size modifier, if any, natural armor, and you take all of those numbers and add them to 10. This will give you your final AC. This is the number the enemy will have to roll in order to hit you. Oh, and please be aware, unless otherwise stated, armor bonuses of the same type do not stack, they overlap. As an example, wearing padded armor underneath full plate will only give you the bonus of the full plate. Certain attacks and abilities affect AC differently. In fact, you have two different kinds. Touch AC, this determines how difficult you are to simply touch. To determine your touch AC, add 10 to your dexterity modifier and any deflection bonuses you have. Some example touch attacks are things like gunshots and ray-based spells. You also have a flat-footed AC. This typically comes into play when you are surprised or flanked. To figure out your flat-footed AC, just subtract your dexterity modifier from your AC. Now let's talk about your saving throws. Some abilities require a saving throw roll. This is a roll of the dice that determines whether a certain effect hits you and how severe it is. You have three kinds of saves. Fortitude saves. These are typically rolled against effects like poison. Your fortitude save is determined by adding your base save plus your constitution modifier. Next, reflex save. This is your ability to dodge or get out of the way. Your reflex is determined by your base save plus your dexterity modifier. Finally, you have a will save. This is your mental resilience. This is determined by your base save 
plus your wisdom modifier. Your base saves are determined by your class or classes. You may also have other miscellaneous bonuses or penalties, provided by things like your race, class features, or situational modifiers. Even items can affect your saves, such as the ever-useful Cloak of Resistance. Now, let's talk about your base attack bonus. This represents the ability of your class or classes to successfully hit with an attack. Now, onto your Combat Maneuver Bonus, or CMB. This is the bonus you add to a roll when determining the effect of a combat maneuver. These are things like Grapple, Bull Rush, or Disarm. Your Combat Maneuver Bonus is your Base Attack Bonus, plus your Strength Modifier, plus your Size Modifier. Certain feats and class features can improve or change this calculation. An example would be the Agile Maneuvers feat. This lets you calculate your CMB using your Dexterity modifier instead of your Strength modifier. You also have a CMD, or Combat Maneuver Defense. This is your ability to resist combat maneuvers. To determine your CMD, add your Base Attack bonus, your Strength modifier, your Dexterity modifier, and any Size modifiers to 10. The final number determines the check that must be made in order for a combat maneuver or similar effect to affect you. Now then, turn your attention to that long column on the right side of page 1. This is your Skills section. Every class is awarded a number of skill points per level. As an example, a wizard gets 2 skill points per level and a rogue gets 8 skill points per level. You also get skill points equal to your intelligence modifier per level. Also, some features of your race or class can modify your skill points. As an example, humans get an additional skill point every level. And the alchemist class gets a bonus to craft alchemy skill checks. In addition to the skill points awarded, every class has class skills. Remember, when you add your first skill point to a class skill, you receive a plus three bonus for having at least one skill point in that skill. You'll also notice that every skill is connected to an ability score. You add the ability score modifier as a bonus, or in some cases penalty, to that skill roll. As an example, a level six mesmerist can have a maximum of six skill points in bluff. This is because you can never have more skill points in a skill than you have character levels. The Mesmerist has a plus four charisma modifier and will get a plus three bonus because bluff is a class skill. Finally, the Mesmerist has a class feature called Consummate Liar that gives him an additional three bonus. All of this adds up to the Mesmerist having a plus 16 to bluff skill checks. Next, a very important section indeed, weapon attacks. You're given several entries for different weapons or different attacks with the same weapon. Obviously, there's a section for the weapon's name, such as longbow, great axe, even spells like scorching ray can go here. Next to that is the section for your attack bonus. This is where you'll write down the bonus that gets added to your d20 roll when making an attack. You'll determine this number by adding your base attack bonus, the relevant ability modifier, such as strength or dexterity modifiers, and your enchantment bonus, if any. The final section of the first line of the weapon section is critical. Weapons can do significantly more damage if a certain number is rolled on the die. Most weapons have a crit range and a damage multiplier. As an example, a pistol has a damage multiplier of times 4, but it only critically hits when a natural 20 is rolled, whereas a rapier has only a times 2 multiplier, but can crit on an 18, 19, or 20 on the die. 
Moving on to the second line of the weapon section. First up is damage type. Weapons deal damage of a certain type, such as bludgeoning. Clubs deal bludgeoning damage. Slashing. Weapons like swords and other edged weapons deal slashing damage. Finally, piercing. This is dealt by pokey swords like the rapier or arrows. Additionally, many spells do energy damage, such as fire, cold, electricity, acid, sound, or force. Different enemies can be susceptible or resilient to different damage types. Next, there's range. This is the effective distance of your weapon. Most melee weapons can only hit adjacent enemies. Some melee weapons, like the lance, have the reach feature. This allows them to hit outside of adjacent squares. Ranged weapons, like bows, have an effective range that comes in increments. As an example, 120 feet for your first range increment. Attempting to strike outside of your range increment will incur compounding penalties. There's also a section for ammunition. This would mostly be for ranged weapons like guns or bows. Finally, there's damage. Weapons deal damage and have damage dice. As an example, a great sword deals 2d6. Long swords deal 1d8. And a scythe will deal 2d4. In the case of melee weapons, you add your strength modifier to the damage your weapon deals. Or in the case of two-handed melee weapons, you deal strength plus 50%. As an example, if you have a plus four strength modifier, you'll deal six points of damage. That concludes page one. Moving on to page two. On the top right, you'll find a section for your spells. The spells section of your character sheet tracks the number of spells you know, at least in the case of spontaneous casters, your spell save DCs. A spell's DC is determined by the spell level plus casting modifier. This may also be influenced by class features or feats. You'll also be able to track the level of your spells. Spell level is different from character level. As a spell caster gains experience and levels, they unlock new levels of magical power, granting them spells of higher levels. Pathfinder 1E spells go all the way from level 0 to 9th level. This section will also track your spells per day. Your spells per day is determined by your class. You'll also be granted bonus spells, as determined by your casting modifier. If you have an intelligence score of 12, you would have a plus one modifier and one bonus spell of first level. Now, if your intelligence was 18, you would have a plus four modifier and bonus spells per day of first, second, third, and fourth level. Now, on the left-hand side, there is a section for AC items. This allows you to list items and how they affect your AC. The first column is for the bonus that you get. This is the flat number that is added to your AC. As an example, leather armor gives you a plus two bonus to AC. Next is the bonus type. This is the kind of bonus your item is providing you. Remember, bonuses of the same type don't stack. Your leather armor gives you a plus two armor bonus, but you could also equip a light wooden shield for a plus one shield bonus. This gives you a total of a plus three bonus to your AC. Next, check penalty. Many AC items are cumbersome and heavy, making certain skill checks more difficult. The armor check penalty is applied to any strength or dexterity based skill that you use. As an example, your leather armor is so light that it has a check penalty of zero, but your light wooden shield is bulky and gives you a minus one to dexterity and strength skill checks. So if you're trying to use an acrobatics check to move through an enemy square in combat, you'll be doing this check 
at a minus one. Next, spell failure. An arcane spellcaster wearing armor incurs a percentage-based penalty that will cause a spell to fail when this spell fail chance is rolled. As an example, a wizard wearing full plate would have a spell fail chance of 35%. But a very cool piece of armor called a silken ceremonial, which although it only has a plus one armor bonus, has a spell fail rate of 0%. AC items also have weight. This is how heavy the item is. Finally, there are properties. Any special effect or trait of the armor goes here. As an example, your leather armor could be made of eel hide. This gives you resistance too to electric damage. Below AC items, you'll find the gear section. Over the course of your adventure, you'll get many items and need even more. It sounds like it should be the other way around, but trust me, someone will forget something. Probably rope. You'll list your gear in this section, things like backpacks, torches, potions, portable rams, figurines of wondrous power, and water clocks. Right next to the gear, you'll find the feats section. As you level up, you'll gain feats. These are special skills and abilities your character has. Everyone gains feats through advancement. You'll get them at 1st level, 3rd level, 5th level, 7th level, and every odd level thereafter. Humans start with a bonus feat at 1st level, and certain classes like Fighter give bonus feats to help you flush out your fighting style. Finally, below feats, you'll find the special abilities. This is where you'll list your class features, as well as the different powers and abilities gained from your race. Thank you very much for watching this Pathfinder 1E character sheet guide from D6 Damage. Now, if you're interested in printed books and game accessories like dice and miniatures, check out Noble Knight Games. You'll find an affiliate link in the description of this video. And if you're looking for a good old-fashioned haunted house mystery, check out Sorceress the Dietrich House an adventure for a party of four level three characters. This is available right now on DriveThruRPG. Follow the link in the description and experience the haunting chills of the Dietrich House. Oh.